This month on the Sounds documentary series Fringe Stream, we head to Washington to meet Gabriel and Sarah, who have decided to live as Victorians, rejecting modern technology, modern food, modern medicine, and even notions of modern gender equality. Never mind living off the grid, these guys have decided to live out of our time. On the long journey down to meet the Victorians, I found myself wondering whether we were going to meet a couple of performance artists, or more likely a pair of uber hipsters who've fallen into an authenticity rabbit hole and simply can't get out. I was really looking forward to meeting them to find out if they were for real. When we got to the house, the light was fading, and we forgot that electricity wasn't part of the Victorian home, which meant we were stumbling about in the dark. Now, when I was a small child, I went to a museum with my mother that was a house museum. And I was at the age when other children were asking their parents to leave them at Disneyland, and I asked, I wanted to stay at the museum. <laughs> there was something so glorious about the aesthetic of it that to someone growing up in a split-level house with polyester carpet, <laughs> that, that just everything being beautiful was very attractive to me. But I always thought, well, that's something that's past. It's something that can't ever happen again. As I was growing up, I heard lots and lots of stereotypes of people saying, oh, it was a horrible era. You wouldn't want to live there. It was awful time to live. And I believed all those things, but then, when Gabriel gave me my first corset, of all of the stereotypes I'd heard, the stereotypes about the corset were the absolute worst. That was the first thing that started it. I wrote an entire book debunking all the myths about corsets, actually. First it was the clothes, and yeah. then it just became more and more of the items of everyday technology. Right. And a lot of that just fit in with my and, and Sarah's dislike. Uh -huh. Both of us have always had a dislike of a lot of modern technology. We've never had cell phones. Neither of us have ever had one. Uh, she's never had a driver's license. Where's the point that you went, oh, that's smart, cool, interesting. Now let's live entirely like that. It's been a long, slow process. The corset was a big milestone and then deciding to move to a Victorian house. With a lot of these things, we can't just jump right into it because we're not, we can't just sort of buy something and, and yeah. institute it. And we've had to learn about the technology, we've had to install technology, we've had to, in her case, make clothes, yeah. uh, you know, and all of it. Nobody's bankrolling this. <laughs> the the male-female dynamic, gender dynamics in the Victorian era. A lot of the, the later interpretations of this is very <laughs> patriarchal, especially, again, the 20th century feminists who believed at the time, and actually now this is sort of crumbling apart, they, they believed the best way to get equality is to make this claim that everyone's the same mm. and that just erased the real differences that do exist. But and again, those same manuals, they, you know, nothing in there sounds misogynistic even to modern eyes. Yeah. Like you read through a bunch of them and it's, it's not, you know, instructions on how to beat your wife. <laughs> it's mostly instructions on how to get along and, you know, utilize those different skill sets and be kind to each other. You know, we love taking the train down to Portland. Uh -huh. uh, we love just cycling around here. It's been important, just must think you guys are a couple of hipsters. Well, well, it must, must just be like, here's a couple of extreme hipsters. We certainly uh, get that. Yeah, yeah we get yeah. that. That's one of the things people think about us. There was actually a rather strong faction of women who were working against women getting the vote. They tend not to get mentioned in history books because it's become politically incorrect to talk about them. If you lay down with dogs, you're gonna wake up with fleas. So they felt that if women got involved in that mudslinging, that some of that would degrade their status as we can't keep calling ourselves the morally superior sex if we're spending our time screaming about how evil our opponent is on a so soapbox. happy not to vote? I would be happy not to vote. I've never seen much benefit from my much touted vote. Again, in society, a lot of people are very focused on the freedoms and, and having basically people be allowed to be things that they can't help being. Mm -hmm. Equal rights for gay people, mm -hmm. who are for all races and all those things that you can't help. And what people forget about is the freedom of choice because those are the freedoms that right now are getting the most curtailed by everyone being sort of just shoved along by a culture that's global and massive and just makes it easy to do what everyone else is doing and it just creates this big boring monoculture. 
making decisions you know, that, that challenge that is really hard because you get singled out, because people look at you and they, the only thing they can associate it with in their minds is religion, is the only thing that might make someone make a different choice. I left the house to head back to the hotel and enjoy some 21st century beer, but I was still not quite clear as to whether they were rejecting modern life, stepping off the grid in a really theatrical and interesting way, or whether there was something perhaps a little weirder going on. The next morning we head back to talk to them again, when there's more light. I decided to ask more about gender equality and advances in medicine, the things it's hard to argue have not improved with time. There's been a lot of negative reaction to what you've done. A lot of people will look at this and they'll, it'll bring up Victorian history, it'll bring up all the stereotypes of Victorian history they've heard about whether it's misogyny or racism or whether it's the robber barons and the, you know, the economy that people see as being terrible. Of course, now we have more disparity in income in this country than we had then because the way we teach history is often to teach about the terrible things that happened and then the politicians because these are the things that have the best documentation, these are the things that make the best stories that stick in people's heads. And then the other thing people assume is people assume that we're trying to live now exactly like people lived in the 1880s and 90s and we're not. I mean the fact is that we better than anyone else know that it's completely impossible to bring back all that infrastructure and all that technology and Things like the ice deliveries. Ice. No one delivers ice anymore. <laughs> if you get sick, you, you, you'd go to a doctor and treat, have modern medical treatment, right? Yeah, I mean, depends on the depends on the sickness. Like antibiotics, great. Yeah, I'd take antibiotics. But surgery? Surgery is something that I would The avoid. treatment has to fit the conditions, and there are a lot of things that we just always have to evaluate case by case basis. Like I said, if I'd had a burst appendix, yes, surgery would have been appropriate. You're trying to kind of educate people about mm -hmm. the past. Mm -hmm. Do you think by living the way you do, it distracts from the message? And they, 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 they're coming at you and asking all these sort of things that I feel like you find quite frustrating as questions. <laughs> it's, again, we didn't expect all of that sort yeah. of interaction with it. We, we were doing this purely because we enjoyed it and so we could learn better from what we were trying to study. Mm -hmm. And in the end, it is a double-edged sword because the fact that we're doing this differently gets us a lot more attention than we would possibly get if we were doing the way people normally do history. We would be ignored. In many ways, it gives us a chance to try to have a bit of a platform to do what we call historical outreach and, and sort of guerrilla history. Do you guys have a lot of friends? Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> That's the simple answer. The way we've done what we've done in terms of collecting all these items and everything, any, any money that was spare for, that people use for going out to eat and everything has, has gone into old technology and ice and wood, that, you know, wood and, and a lot of things that everyone else doesn't have to pay for. You, you mentioned last night that your family doesn't entirely support your, your decision. Yeah. What is it about what you've chosen to do or be that they seem to reject? I'm different than they are. <laughs> I guess that's the short answer. But everyone's yeah. different from mm -hmm. people. I know. There must be something about the difference that they push back against. Well, families are complicated. You know, beyond her mom specifically, mm -hmm. the people that have the biggest problems with what we do are women of the baby boomer generation, the people who were sort of the most rabid feminists. And they have a big negative reaction against what Sarah does because of the clothing, because of all the associations that they have in their head with the Victorian era that are all of these stereotypes, many of which were, in our mind, created by them, <laughs> created by the, the 1960s and 70s feminists because they needed a foil, they needed a villain, they needed a way to demonize uh, past culture in order to try to affect the change they were trying to create. And this was the huge rebellion of their lives against their parents. And now, if other people aren't supporting that, you know, supporting all of their ideas that they, you know, in their mind fought so hard for. Um, but invented, really. <laughs> but really invented. Um, they, they feel betrayed or they feel that someone is, is, you know, just not understanding or whatever it is they feel. And if they're going to say, so. hands off my body, <laughs> you've got to let me have that freedom too. <laughs> the people think that they are talking about women's liberation and everything, and actually there, it's just a new subjugation. Right. A new conformity to, you know, a different conformism than used to exist. We believe in diversity, and we believe in diversity of thought, we believe in diversity of lifestyle, we believe in 
you know, diversity of interest in history and interest in everything else, and we believe in expressing all of that. And we ideally don't want society to persecute us or anyone else for that diversity. Choosing to live in a different way, to live a life on the fringes of mainstream culture, is not just a reaction to modern life, but also a highly personal experience with deep meaning to the individuals who make these choices. There's a deep and sometimes fascinating human story behind the people who are living in the fringe stream. And that story might just be as interesting as the trend itself. <laughs>